Over the last few years, some luxury watches have outperformed both the stock market and real estate. Are luxury watches a better investment than the stock market? Time to think like an investor. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Josh. I run a wealth management firm and I'm obsessed with these ideas of like financial independence, investing, and just living life on your own terms. If you guys are into that sort of thing too, make sure to smash that red little subscribe button down below so we can grow like crazy, just like these red Rolex Pepsis, these GMTs. They're going crazy. It's insane. And for most people out there, there's really two perspectives that you can really have on the whole luxury watch segment. There's the, man, that's an insane waste of money. Who on earth is spending that much money on watches? And then there's the other segment, which is kind of like the collectors, the people who see these as timeless pieces of art, things they like to collect, and maybe even things that could go up in value over time. And you know, I empathize with both points of view. For instance, quick story, one time, I was at an investment conference in New York. It's a fantastic conference, I loved it, and I was sitting in the crowd as one speaker went up. His name was Scott Galloway. And if you haven't heard of Scott Galloway, I highly encourage you to go look into his stuff. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy. And he gets up on stage and he says, all right, who in here has a luxury watch that they would consider a luxury watch? And you know, at that conference, like half of the people put up their hand. And then he says, okay, who of you think that the purpose of your watch is to tell the time, right? And everyone goes, yeah, of course. Like that's the reason you buy a watch is to tell the time. And he goes wrong. What you have on your wrist is a $10,000, $15,000 piece of metal that signals to other mates, propagate with me because I have abundance. <laughs> and the whole crowd kind of breaks out laughing. And I was like, oh man, yeah, I kind of raised my hand for both of those things. And you know, there's some truth to that. A lot of about these watches or jewelry or any of these things is they are to some degree just purely a status symbol. You're trying to signal that you, you know, you've done well. And I, I, I think that is certainly partially true, but there is another side to this. And you know, 90% of you or 95% of you will think I am crazy for saying this, but 5% of you, 10% of you will really get it. Watch collectors understand that a watch kind of has a soul and, and that sounds crazy, but it really does. You, you build a relationship with the watch over time. You know, you have to wind it. You have to keep it clean. You have to, you know, it's, it's on your wrist all day and you use it to tell time. And, um, there is certainly some aspect of it that you almost build a relationship with your collection, which is, I know super weird, something I never thought I would say, but it's crazy. And I mean, some of the coolest things about these watches, for instance, is that, you know, they're automatic hundreds or 50, whatever, how many years ago, people figured out how to make a watch perpetually tell the time without needing to put a battery in. And they're making these things by hand. A Rolex takes a year to make by hand. It's not made by a machine. And back in the day when people were diving underwater to try to find hidden treasure, whatever it might be, these people trusted their Rolex to tell them how much time they had before they had to, you know, before they were gonna run out of air. Pilots use, you know, the GMT to determine time zones and different things like that before we had the technology to do it. So there really is history, there really is heritage to these things, but at the same time, yeah, for sure, there are some element of them are just status because, you know, every single celebrity wears them and all the, you know, Tiger Woods wears a Rolex. That's really the brand value behind these things. But today, I wanna to talk about the investment value of watches because I posted one video on my channel, you can go watch it, it talks about how I need to sell my Rolex because it, I'm realizing that it's actually an investment problem for me. The value is rising enough that it's kind of creating this imbalance in my portfolio. And from that video, a ton of you guys kind of were, actually that video got the most comments I think I've ever had on a video. And a lot of people came into my direct messages on social media or were contacting me saying, hey, I wanna learn more about this whole watch thing. So it's interesting. It isn't a traditional investment, but a lot of people are starting to think about it that way. And that's where I wanna start. First things first, a Rolex, a watch, a luxury you know, piece of jewelry is not an investment by traditional investment terms. For something to be an investment, it has to produce cash flow. You know, a farm, every single year it's going to produce cash flow because you till the fields and you have livestock and you can make money from those things and the livestock propagates. If you have a business, you have people in that business running the business, providing value, you know, driving sales. 
Um, if you have even something like a rental property, you have a piece of property that's generating rent, right? These things are income producing. Now a bar of gold, a Rolex, these things don't produce income. If I buy a Rolex this year, in 30 years, I only have one Rolex. It hasn't produced more value. So in my view, a Rolex is not an investment. It's a speculative asset. But I wanna talk a little bit more about the price gains that we've seen in these speculative assets and maybe even if it compares to the stock market. So one of the really weird, quirky things about me that like you know, my parents used to come downstairs into my basement. I was like, a, like not even a toddler, but like a, a child. And I was always watching Antiques Roadshow, which is hilarious because a lot of people find that to be super boring. But on a certain episode of Antiques Roadshow, I found there was a gentleman who bought a Rolex GMT in the 60s. Pay for this watch. This watch, I paid the uh, $120. The other watch, which um, had a, some gold to the bracelet, I bought from my dad and I paid $104 for that. So this guy goes and buys a watch that he doesn't really even know what it is and he spends $120 on it. And to him, he said, you know, that was a little over one month's salary in the military back in 1960, which is crazy to think about how much wage inflation there's been. But I wanna dive into what is that watch worth today and how much is the average military salary today to kind of compare the returns of let's say inflation and maybe even the stock market to what his watch was worth. Take a look at how crazy this watch is valued today. It's a very, very collectible watch. Just the watch on its own merit would be worth today between thirty-five and forty-five thousand dollars. But this watch is worth much more because you save the box and all the paperwork for it easily today. It's sixty-five to seventy-five thousand dollars in the market. So $120 to now $70,000. That's insane. Like that is 583 times what he paid for the watch. And if you think about, I, I even went and looked at the numbers. What is the average military salary today? And it came out about 3,500 in America. And what that means is military salaries multiplied by about 37 times over that time period. Whereas the value of this watch multiplied 583 times. And what that means is that the watch increased in value 16 times the wage inflation, which is crazy. So now what I wanna talk about is what is that as a compounded return? If you're thinking about like investing, you think in terms of compounded returns. Well, over this time period, the S&P 500, the overall stock market, compounded at about 10.1% per year. This watch going from 120 bucks to $70,000 compounded at 11.1% a year. So that's crazy because over even a 60 year span, that's a lot of data, that's a lot of sample size. This watch effectively beat the stock market. Now, the tricky thing is you're, you kind of have to determine which watches will do well and which ones don't because there are many different types of Rolexes or other watches that are actually going to depreciate in value and won't even grow. So it's about picking the right one. And that brings me to kind of my story. I walked into a jewelry store and I got just super lucky. And I talked to the right guy and we were hitting it off and we had a fantastic time just chatting about watches. And I was kind of asking him like, which of these watches do you think are gonna go up in value? I'm thinking of rewarding myself. I'm this status hungry kid trying to impress my friends. I've made a big lump sum of cash young in my 20s and I'd like to buy a luxury watch. And he says, oh, okay, well, any of the watches that are gonna go up in value, you can't get right away. You're gonna to have to get on a wait list for, but this green Rolex Hulk Submariner, if you can get your hands on one, that's gonna go up in value. And I was like, okay, that sounds great. How long is it gonna take? He said, six months. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. So I waited the six months, I put a deposit down, and now I have this green Rolex Hulk Submariner, which I kind of actually love. So I bought this watch in late 2016, which was approximately four years ago. And I bought it for about 10,500 Canadian dollars, okay? And now when I look online, the cheapest thing I can find, I mean, they go as high as 30,000 Canadian, but the cheapest one I can find is about 24,000. That's probably what I would get for this watch. So it's appreciated quite nicely. It's been a good investment. Over the same time period, if we compound that return, you know, going from 10,500 to 24,000, that equates to a 23% compounded return. Whereas the S&P 500 over that period did 13.5%. So this is really screwing with my mind right now because I was hoping to do this video and tell you guys that no Rolexes are a bad investment. Don't buy them because stocks are income producing and they're way better. Um, but the short run evidence appears to uh, disagree with that.
But as a lot of watch collectors will know, if you're fans of watches whatsoever, this isn't really a good estimation of the average Rolex because I got pretty lucky with this one. And that guy on Antiques Roadshow, he got massively lucky with his. So let's maybe take a look at kind of the base Rolex, the most popular one, and see what that has done over the same time period. A steel banded black Rolex Submariner day date, or not day date, just the date. It means it shows the date on it. That's kind of one of the most common Rolex watches. And over the same time period, from when I bought mine until now, let's call it late 2016 until now, that watch was priced at 9,500 Canadian dollars and is now priced around 15,000 on average in the retail market. So that again is a massive gain. If we look at that relative to the S&P 500, as we know, we got about 13.5% on the S&P 500 over the last four years, whereas the stainless steel Submariner, even just the basic Submariner, did 12.1%. So it's only lagging the S&P 500 by a little tiny bit, which is crazy. I never really thought that the returns on these watches were this reliable. And maybe there's something I'm not seeing. There's probably watch collectors out there that could tell me much better about the price changes, but it appears to me that these things, I mean, e at least in, in the near past have done extremely well. This is all great in theory because it's like, oh, this makes sense. You buy a watch, it goes up in value. You get to wear this shiny thing and show all your friends that you have this really expensive watch. But it's a little bit different in practice because you can't just walk into a Rolex store and buy whatever Rolex you want. You know, even recently I went in with a friend and I was blown away to find that in order to get the watch you want, you would have to build a relationship with a jeweler. And what they mean by build relationship with is like buy three or, you know, two or three other watches that are 10, 20,000 bucks just to prove that you're really in it. And then you can get the watch you want. So <laughs> it's not so easy as just going and buying one because second thing, if you're going to buy a watch you want, you're gonna to have to buy it on the secondary market. If you're not getting it retail, you're gonna already be buying at an inflated price. Contrast that with the S&P 500, you can easily buy that right now. You can go set up a brokerage account and very simply just put the money in the stock market, let it compound, and now you have an income producing asset that's almost, it at least has much more of a guarantee of producing a return for you than, than a watch, which is more speculative. All of that being said, we all know that S&P 500 index funds are not nearly as fun to talk about with your friends as a Rolex and chatting about the money you spent on your watch and networking with all the other collectors. If you guys got any value out of today's video, I just wanna thank you so much for watching. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit like, and we'll see you guys in the next video.